الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذه أمتكم أمة واحدة وأنا ربكم فاعبدون First and foremost, I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As always, I hope that I find you all in good health, wealth, and iman. And simultaneously, I ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives me the strength to speak in front, of you, in front of you with confidence and clarity and to give a reminder that's beneficial and effective. And I start with something basic, perhaps something that we already know. When we define a successful Muslim community or a successful masjid, it's not in those things that perhaps we may think it may be in. When we define a, success, a successful masjid, it's not the square footage of the masjid that defines it to be successful. Or if that masjid has a minarat, or how beautiful the carpet may be, or how up to date the speaker system may be. What defines a successful masjid or a Muslim community, it's in its unity, it's in its tolerance, it's in its forbearance. It's in its diversity, it's in its togetherness. And that's something that was defined by the Prophet ﷺ. He had an open arm policy to all the companions, regardless of what ethnicity, what tribe, what culture, what social status that they came from. And matter of fact, in one of the companions, one of the Prophet's companions by the name of Salman, the Prophet ﷺ would encourage him to tell his story as to how he accepted Islam so that, his, that the other Sahabis, that the other companions can derive motivation and encouragement from his story. So I start with the story of Salman Farsi radiallahu an. You get it from his name, he came from Persia which is modern day Iran. And Salman Farsi radiallahu an tells his story that he was the only child and that his father was the leader of their tribe. And that his father was very controlling of him to the extent that Salman radiallahu an explains to us that he felt like he was being treated like a girl, that he had restrictions, he couldn't leave the house. And you know, some of the cultures that we come from, those restrictions do exist. And one time, his father gave him a chore and told him that I need you to go to the city and drop something off. And as he was leaving to the city, he sees a church. And he enters the church and he starts to realize that these people are worshipping something that, that they, it is better than what he worships. Because the culture or the tribe that Salman Farsi was from, they used to worship fire. So he spent this day in the church and he was absorbing these people and he came to this realization that this religion is better than what we believe in. And after spending the whole day with this, these people, he quickly went back to his father and explained to him his experience. And when his father heard of it, he got really upset. He said, that's it. I can't, I can't have you leaving the house now. So Salman Farsi radiallahu an, being a teenager at that time, was able to tell those people telling them that if there is a caravan ever leaving that city, please let me know because he asked them a question, where did you guys learn this religion from? And they told them that we learned it from Balad al-Sham, which is current day Syria. 
And he goes, if there were a caravan to come from there, let me know so that I can leave with them and go and study this religion. So those people told him that there's a caravan going to Balad al-Sham and if you want you should join them and he did. He escaped his house and he leaves for Balad al-Sham. And then he narrates his first experience that when he went to a church and he was with the priest, he noticed some shady things about that priest that he was stealing money from the community. And when the community members inquired about how the money was being spent, he told them that he's stealing the money and he's using it for himself. So the people of that congregation wanted to make an example out of him and they killed him. So Salman Farsi radiallahu an goes to the other. He finds another teacher, another priest. And he shares that experience saying that it was a good experience. I learned a lot from him until he passed away. And I went on to another teacher. And this happened for, for a few years that he went from one priest to another. And the last priest that he was with while he was passing away, he asked him, who should I go to now? I've learned so much from you. He said that there's no more priest that you're going to learn from. Whatever you learn, the maximum knowledge it was from me. But according to our scripture, there is a prophet to come who's going to come from the Arab nation where there's a lot of palm dates. And he gives them the description of that city. And he said, you should go there. So Salman Farsi radiallahu an found some merchants, some businessmen who were headed towards Arabia. And he asked them that, look, I'll give you some money, just take, make sure that I, I end up in the right location. When he's with these merchants, what do they do? They do him wrong. When they get to the city, they sell him as a slave. He sold as a slave. I want you to really imagine this. When today you go to Target and you purchase your bread or you purchase a shirt or you purchase eggs, it's a buying and selling thing. Salman Farsi radiallahu an was sold just like that as a slave. And here is this man searching for the truth and he is enslaved. Later on, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if, if, if the truth was on another planet, Salman would have found the truth. He would have found the truth. And as Muslims, you know today when we have questions about our religion and we don't, we don't truly understand, we stop our understanding of the religion and we say, you know what, this is a bit too much for us. As a true believer, our search for the truth should go beyond our, our, our expectation. It should go well above beyond that. So Salman Farsi radiallahu an is enslaved. And he sold to a person from the tribe of Banu Qurayza, who was a Jewish man. And then later on, he sells them forward to his cousin. And when Salman Farsi radiallahu an ends up in Medina, and he looks at the palm dates, and he looks at the city that he was in, he realized that this is the place that his preacher was telling him about. He goes, this is where I need to be. So one day Salman Farsi radiallahu an, who's, he's working in the trees collecting the dates, and he hears, he hears his master talking about something and he's very agitated. He said that, you know, the Arabs of this community, they're getting together, they're in the city called Quba, and they're getting together in this, there's this, person by the name of Muhammad and he's gathering them together. When Salman Farsi radiallahu an heard that name Muhammad, he almost fell off the tree. And he went to his master, who are you talking about? And his master slapped and told him that, look, you're a servant, I don't have to answer to you. So later on, a week later, Salman Farsi gathers up some dates and he heads out to Quba to meet this Prophet that people are talking about, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But before I go into that, his preacher told him that there's three signs about, you'll know that he is the true Prophet of Allah. Number one, if you give him charity, he'll never eat from charity. So Salman Farsi radiallahu an, he gathers all these dates, he goes and meets the Prophet of Allah and says, look, these dates are from charity. So please go ahead and distribute it amongst your companions. I know you're tired, you just had this long trip from Mecca. Have these dates. So, and Salman radiallahu an, he's, he's watching him, he's, he's absorbing him, making sure that he doesn't eat from charity. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passes out those dates and he doesn't eat one. So he passes the first sign. The second sign is that if you ever offer him a gift, he'll never refuse it. So a few weeks later, because he's a servant of Allah, he has nothing to give. He gathers up some more dates. 
And he heads back to now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in Medina. He gathers up some more dates and he says, look, these dates are a gift for me. So please go ahead and enjoy it and make sure that you pass it on to your companions. And Salman Farsi radiallahu an is absorbing him again. And he watches him. And he sees that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam eats a few dates and passes it out to his companion. So he passes the second test, or that second sign. The third sign the preacher told him about that you'll know he's the Prophet of Allah is that he has a mark in his shoulder blade, in between his shoulder blades. And during those times, the clothes that they used to wear is like how when we go for Hajj, we wear ihram, it's a two-piece. So once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going in a janazah, and Salman Farsi radiallahu an was following him, trying to see his back. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam noticed that, who is this person following me? It's kind of awkward. And he noticed that it's Salman. And he noticed that he wanted to see that sign on his back. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shows him that mark on his back. And when Salman Farsi radiallahu an saw that sign or that mark, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abuduhu wa rasuluh. He accepts Islam, he converts into Islam. But the story doesn't end because he's a slave. These Muslims of Medina are battling in the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Badr. They're all coming and praying salat in Majid al Nabawi. Imagine praying with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam five times a day. And Salman, he's unable to experience those moments because he's a slave and he's feeling sad. So he goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I cannot, I cannot participate in any of the activities because I'm a, I'm a slave. What should I do? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, you should negotiate your freedom. Go talk to your master and negotiate your freedom. So Salman Farsi radiallahu an goes and talks to his master and says, what can I do to obtain my freedom? His master knowing why he wants, to, he wants freedom, because he can be a free Muslim. So what does he do? He kind of raises the price. He says, I want you to, I want you to uh, uh, plant 300 palm date trees, a whole garden. Even nowadays in current times, that's very hard to do. But not only that, I want you to give me 40 grams of gold. SubhanAllah. This is Salman Farsi who doesn't even own the clothes on his back. It's a crazy amount to ask for a person who is a slave. But at least now he has a resolution. So he goes back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he tells him, look, this is what he's asking for my freedom. So what does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? He calls all the companions. And he says, A'inu akhakum. Everybody help your Muslim brother. And Salman Farsi radiallahu anh sitting next to the Prophet, just wondering how he's gonna get his freedom. One by one, one companion brings 10 palm date trees. Another brings five. Another brings 15. Another brings 20. Another brings 30. And at the end of the day, it added up to 300 palm date trees. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells the companion, Go to his master's house and prepare the land. Prepare the land, dig the holes. And once you've digged the holes, let me know. I will personally put each of the trees in its holes. They prepare the land and then they call the Prophet of Allah, come and help him. Come and uh, plant these trees. And after each of the holes were made, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam literally took each tree and planted it himself. And for those of us who are familiar with gardening, when you plant something, not necessarily that plant is gonna live. Salman Farsi radiallahu anh says, I swear by Allah, all 300 of those trees existed. They never died. All 300 of those trees were planted and they didn't die. But there was one more condition. There was one more condition. Those 40 grams of gold. Time passed on. And Salman Farsi was still a slave because he wasn't able to pay that 40 grams of gold. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked, he goes, where's Salman? I know there's one more condition left. Go call for him. And they went and called Salman. And Salman radiallahu an came and he said, where have you been? He goes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you've done so much for me. I'm kind of embarrassed to ask you a little bit more. 
He goes, Salman, someone just gave me this gift. And it was unwrapped. It was a big block of gold. And he said, hey, go give this to your master. And he said, Rasulullah, how am I supposed to pay you back? Don't worry about it. He said, Allah will pay me back. So Salman Farsi radiallahu an takes this big block of gold and goes back, to, goes back to his master. And he goes, here, this should be enough to obtain my freedom. So his master had a scale. A literally, he had a scale. He took out a scale and he weighed the gold. So he takes the piece of gold and he weighs it. What was the weight? It was exactly 40 grams of gold. Subhanallah. And that's the story of Salman Farsi. And that's how he obtained his freedom. You know, the gist of the story is that when Salman Farsi radiallahu an, when he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asking for help. Asking for help. And he said, Rasulullah, I want my freedom. What should I do? And the Prophet of Allah called all of the companions. And what did he say? A'inu akhakum. Everybody help your brother. Everybody help your brother. Didn't the companions, they didn't respond. You know, Rasulullah, he's a foreigner. We're not from the same tribe. When he speaks Arabic, it's a little funny. He's not like us. He's not like us. Why should we help him? No, a'inu akhakum. Everybody help your brother. Because as Muslims, when we say La ilaha illallah, that statement goes above and beyond any culture, any ethnicity, any language that we speak. You know, nowadays we take pride from the countries that we're from. You know, I'm from this country, I'm from this culture, I'm from this tribe. And unfortunately, it starts to shower over in our masjids. And we start to say, you know, this is an Arab masjid, this is a Pakistani masjid, this is that masjid, this is that masjid. And no, this is not the right way. We never had a choice from the countries that we were going to be from. We didn't have a choice that the language we were going to speak. We never had a choice. So what are you so proud of? Then the question arises, you never had a choice in being a Muslim either. Exactly. You being a Muslim is a privilege, is an honor, is a distinction. And it goes above and beyond anything. You know what? After we finish this khutbah, and we're going to pray our salah, and we're going to pray our salah. This salah is such an intimate action. It's something so private. And we get to do it with our Muslims, our, our fellow Muslims, brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter what culture we come from, what tribe we come from, what language we speak. So that should remind us that our Islam, our saying La ilaha illallah goes above and beyond any of our culture or our ethnical differences. You know the ayah that I read, Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatun wahida, wa ana rabbukum fa'budun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that this is one ummah, one singular ummah, one ummah, He repeats itself. This is one ummah, and I am your Lord, therefore worship me. Therefore worship me. You know today, when you finish the salah, do something different. You know when after the salah and you know normally I, I see this, it's kind of like high school. After salah, people only want to say salam to the people that they know. And they kind of group up. And they only meet the people that they know and they don't care about everybody else. Do something a little different. Meet the person that you don't know. And introduce yourself. And tell them where you're from. And if you have an opportunity, invite them over. And I'll start with myself. My name is Sayyid Junaid. And I love being a part of this community. بارك الله لنا ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغض يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أقم الصلاة